my pleasure as part of the Centennial History Committee to interview Dr. Harry McFadden, his experiences here at the College of Medicine, past and present. When did you come on campus, Dr. McFadden? Frank, my first appearance on campus as a student was in September of 1940. September of 1940. You had taken your pre-medicine? At uh, the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Okay. Now, before coming, what was the process at that time as far as the entrance interview or just the process for admission? Well, uh, in Lincoln, and I suspect most of the colleges and universities around the state, we had what was called the New Med Club. Perhaps you were a member of that club and it was a pre-medical organization <clears throat> and we got some information about medical school and the admission process, but precious little. My interview was with uh, C. William McCorkle Pointer, the, the then dean and, and dean for many years, and I remember that experience well to this day. Uh, it was located on what we would call level four, where the neurology offices currently are, are placed. You remember the marble floor mm -hmm. and things. Dean Pointer had his office there, and, and uh, each uh, interviewee uh, went to his office and waited an appropriate period of time and were invited into really a small office and he then had some Parkinson's disease and he was an avid smoker of Fatima cigarettes and he'd light up a, a Fatima cigarette and my interview question was, son, what do you know about Hindu philosophy? Hindu philosophy. Hindu philosophy, and, and I knew precious little about Hindu philosophy, and after a few clearings of the throat and mumblings, I, I guess I allowed as how I didn't really know much about Hindu philosophy. And he agreed with me and said, that's all, and the interview was, was at an end. And I waited around for, for some weeks, and it seemed like months after that interview, and was ultimately accepted to, to medical school. I learned later he was the admissions committee as well as the sole interviewer of candidates for school. You know, in his pictures, he appears so stern. Is that a correct impression as you knew him over the years? He did appear very stern, and I suspect most of the faculty were far more formal in those days with students than is true today, but in actuality, he was a very warm and, and friendly person, but I really did not learn that until I was an intern at the University of Nebraska Hospital, and he was a raconteur with uh, interns and, and residents of that, that day. You came in September. Who were your instructors the first couple of years? First well, years. The, the initial instructors uh, were Dr. John Latta, uh, Dr. Ed Holyoke, uh, in anatomy in particular, Dr. Manuel Gradinsky was ending his uh, uh, tenure as a teacher and was a very effective and, and dramatic teacher, as you may already have learned. In what was then <clears throat> called bacteriology, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, oh, fiddle. Gunderson. Dr. Gunderson, my good friend, was mm -hmm. the the professor, and Dr. John Slack was the laboratory instructor. Johnny Slack went on to be the professor and chairman at at West Virginia, mm -hmm. and at uh, Morgantown, and and held that position for many, many years until very recent uh, uh, times. And they were the principal ones that we saw in, in that uh, initial year. Mm -hmm. And second year? In the second year, we saw uh, our friends in, in biochemistry, and uh, Dr. Uh, Jacoby was the laboratory instructor, and Dr. Morgulis was, was the professor, and there are many fond tales about all of these people. 
in physiology and pharmacology, Drs. Bennett and McIntyre were, were the principal instructors. And uh, so it was a fantastic group. I'm sure I've uh, forgotten some of the people. Pathology. Who was teaching pathology? Uh, Dr. Harold Eggers was chairman of the department, and uh, Dr. Perry Tolman taught some of the classes, and uh, Dr. Baker was then at the Methodist, and he helped with the pathology teaching. But in pathology, it was largely those three individuals. Mm -hmm. So you survived the first two years? Yes, I survived the first two years. Many did not survive the first two years. In those days, our entering class was approximately 99, if my memory is correct, and I believe 76 graduated with the class. The bulk of people who dropped out were during the freshman year, Frank. Mm. So then you went to the junior and senior years? Yes, in, in the junior and senior years, uh, I would say the, the program is, is far more didactic or was more didactic than is currently true. In the junior year, we had many clinical courses by lecture and, and textbook reading. Many of the clinical faculty were off in World War II at, at that particular time. And most of our patient contacts during the junior year were in the so-called clinical clerkship, which Dr. Esley Kirk headed. And uh, we had extensive write-ups of patients in those days, history, physical, uh, correlation, laboratory findings, library studies, and the like. The senior year was more rotations in dispensary and, and in clinical rotations, more akin to what it is today. What buildings were on campus at that time? That would be the early 40s. In the early 40s, the North Building, the South Building, uh, the old nursing building was there. Now, that's the original one, Conkling Hall and units one and two of the hospital. Mm -hmm. So the present hospital was, was not here at all. And that was, of course, before Children's Memorial Hospital? Correct. Or an NPI? Correct. Or Clarkson, really? Correct. Across the street. Clarkson was then downtown in mm -hmm. location. Mm -hmm. Finished medical school? Correct. What did you do? Well, when I finished medical school, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And, and uh, so uh, Dr. Pointer was very instrumental in selection of internships at, at that time. And, and uh, he suggested, why didn't I spend a, a year here? And, and his suggestion was usually accepted by students without too much debate. And so I did spend a year here in, in internship, and, and following that, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And, and my friend and mentor, Dr. Perry Tolman, said, why don't you spend nine months in residency in pathology? By that time, the war was on, and, and the programs were all accelerated to nine months from a year. So I did that and enjoyed that very much. And after that, it was on into the military. And uh, in the class at Carlisle Barracks I was with, we were greeted by a general who informed us that we were intended to hit the beach of Japan. And that was a great motivating speech, <laughs> I might say. We, we took seriously the, uh, the education and the training we received there and, until while we were there, the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan, and, mm -hmm. and I must say that the attention and, and span of our educational activity changed when, when that happened. Subsequently uh, to that, we were sent around the, the world, really, and my first bit in the Army was back through Omaha to Fitzsimmons, hospital in Denver, and I taught school to uh, enlisted technologists in radiology and laboratory for about 
nine months, I suppose. <clears throat> From there, I went to Germany. And uh, it was interesting. I went over on one of the general ships, if, if you were have ever seen them or remember them. They were converted ships, usually long and narrow. And I was with 75 physicians and 75 dentists. And we landed in La Harve and took a... Uh, after a day or two, a third-class train through Paris to Marburg, Germany. And Marburg was a replacement depot at the end of the war. And I had had nine months of pathology, you, you remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, a colonel read off three names. Mine was among them. <clears throat> the other two had had nine months training in pathology. And he said, would two of the others present be interested in working in the discipline of pathology? And everyone looked at each other and around the room, and finally a couple of hands went up, and the five of us went to the theater uh, laboratory, which was then located in Darmstadt. After a month, I went on to Berlin and was head of the laboratory in Berlin for about a year and a half, something of the sort. With that nine months of training, I was the second most experienced pathologist in the ETO, wow. believe it or not. Wow. Wow. After the war, is that when you came back to? I came back, and uh, by that time, I had decided I liked pathology and, and infectious diseases and microbiology, so I looked around for really a residency program at that time. And I remember looking in Denver and, and Chicago and Omaha in particular, and, and Denver was then <clears throat> so full of physicians returned from the war that there was little uh, hope of doing much there. And Chicago, I guess, was too big a city for me, although I had lived there for a few years in my early days. So I came back to Omaha and finished my training in pathology Who and joined was the faculty. Who pathology at that time? At that time, uh, Dr. Perry Tolman was in charge of pathology here at the uh, medical center, and Dr. Rudy Schenken had come while I was away in the Army and was prominent in pathology in the department at that time. And uh, Rudy became the chairman of pathology when Perry went off into the service, mm -hmm. joined the Air Force for a few years. Mm -hmm. So you remained in pathology? That's right. And I started in uh, really in pathology and had a an appointment uh, as an instructor and then an assistant professor in what was then the Department of Pathology and Bacteriology. Bacteriology. And the two departments divided in the early 50s, Frank. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I then had an appointment in, in both departments because of my interest. My interest in microbiology began really when I was in medical school. And uh, I've sort of been in and out of both departments since that time. You sure have. You sure have. You've also been very active as far as the administrative approach here. You've been the interim chancellor on two occasions. Correct. I don't know why, why anyone would be so foolish as to take that job <laughs> twice, right? But I was uh, interim chancellor uh, after Dr. Whitson. Mm -hmm and uh, then again after Dr. Sparks. Very good. Very good. You've also been very active in the State Medical Association, haven't you? That's correct, for quite a number of years. I've enjoyed that. It's helped me keep up my, my friendships with students and physicians I've known around the state for many years. I'm still active in state medical activities. For historical reasons, Dr. John Schenken, how did you view him as a person who was in the department and also as a leader mm -hmm. in Midwest medicine, national medicine, actually. Yeah. Well, Rudy Schenken was certainly a, a very unique person, Frank. Uh, amazingly talented, very warm, very friendly. Uh, Rudy was a, a very 
firm person in the sense that he had strong personal opinions and convictions about about many things and, and uh, certainly I always enjoyed and, and treasured the associations that I had with with Rudy Schenken and uh, I feel that he was one of my mentors and, and I think uh, fine friends. <laughs> I remember early on when the departments were divided and I became a chairman of microbiology, about the time that uh, electron microscopes first came into being and looked like an antique radio set, uh, I approached Rudy about the possibility of acquiring a, an electron microscope. And, at that time, he didn't see the value of one for education in the mm -hmm. medical center. And, and we parted ways on that particular issue. And I said, well, I'm sorry. I think we do. And I'm going to have to go at my own on, on this instance. And a number of years later, he said, well, you were sure right about that. And he was, he was an amazing person in that he had a, an ability to uh, uh, be in a differing position mm -hmm. from people and yet maintain excellent friendships. It never was a personal issue with, with Rudy. And he had those <clears throat> same talents nationally, both in pathology and in medicine generally. So he was a uh, very fine person and very excellent teacher too. Students who heard him lecture will never forget the experience, I'm sure. May I ask, what is your age now? I'm 63, Frank. What do you plan to do? Well, I haven't thought a great deal about it. Uh, a few years ago, I had uh, some major surgery done, and, and uh, I guess that started me thinking about the future for uh, about in a different way than I had ever thought about it before in a number of, of respects. I suppose... Uh, at that time, I first realized <coughs> what patients went through when some major thing happened to them. My wife happened <coughs> to go through a similar experience shortly after I did, so uh, that's colored my thinking a little bit, and, and uh, so I'm a little bit ambivalent, to be honest with you. Uh, uh, some a lot of the world I haven't seen there are a lot of things I'd like to do my wife would like to do so sometimes I think well why don't you go do those things at the same time I really like what I'm doing and our health has been very good after those episodes and and I hate to give up what I enjoy doing too so well, it's a know, difficult decision well, you know, and I really you... haven't made it Ambivalent, of course, as you know, is a psychiatric word. Well, and maybe I used but you don't poor have to, word. <laughs> but you don't have to be ambivalent. What you have done, I think, as a physician in our area, as a leader of our medical center, I think also as a leader in the spirit of John Schenken, as far as the model and pathology, there's no ambivalence there. Well, I thank appreciate you. Appreciate your comments Thank very you. much. Right. Thank you.